Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, pictured here, uh, talking about my world travels, this is the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Spain. Construction on this cathedral began in 1886, and as of 2010, it was only about 50% complete, and is not expected to be completed until 2026. Uh, the architect of the cathedral, uh, whenever the subject was brought up of the extremely long construction, uh, he would reply that his uh, client is in no hurry. So, on, if you've been around Paul's Body Shop or been around Perry Paul over the last four years, uh, there's been an extremely long restoration on this car you see here, uh, which is the Motown Missile. Uh, but to kind of understand uh, sort of the importance uh, that we've placed on this car and the reason that it's taken so long, I'm going to read from an article on allpart.com. It says, uh, the name echoes through the minds of people familiar with the early years of pro stock racing. Only three cars can be called the missile. Ted Spahar and his gang built and raced a 1970 Challenger, a 1972 Cuda, and a 73 Duster. During the dawn of stock car racing, they had more launches down the drag strip than any other cars. Testing, innovation, hard work, and long hours were the norm. To paraphrase another famous gentleman, Never have so few done so much with so little or so many. So as we took on this project, uh, you can see this is the car here that we are restoring. Uh, the other two have been restored, and uh, the one in the middle is the 72 Barracuda that was thought to be lost forever. Uh, so it was the sister to those other two cars, and they were really missing the middle one there. Uh, this is the cover of the Hot Rod magazine uh, in 1972, uh, where the car was featured. And if you can see really small above where it says on the headline, it says the trickiest pro stock ever built. Uh, these cars uh, were factory sponsored by Plymouth and uh, one of the main purposes of it was to uh, promote the Hemi engine that everybody's heard of. And uh, so, you know, these cars would go along the assembly line and before they would ever be given a vehicle identification number, they would be pulled off the assembly line and go directly into the race shop. Uh, no expense was spared. They used uh, innovative things. Uh, they used magnesium bolts uh, to save weight. Uh, they, this was one of the first cars, probably the first car to ever run two distributors on the engine, which is something that's commonplace among all drag cars now. Uh, they didn't have wind tunnels back in those days, but they even taped little, uh, there's pictures where they taped little feathered uh, threads of cotton and would run it down the drag strip and see how those uh, threads of cotton uh, would react to the wind and the resistance. And uh, of course, safety wasn't a major issue back in the 70s either. <laughs> to video this or to photograph it, uh, another team member would ride alongside the car, uh, hanging his head out the window, taking pictures of the car as it was coming down. Uh, so uh, like most any race car, it's, it's just a race car. In the 70s, they didn't know you know, what was the importance of this car? So once uh, the 73 Duster came along, it's just another race car and it's for sale. Uh, but some words that was found here in a newspaper article, um, or at least a classified ad uh, when the car came up for sale, says it's once in a lifetime deal. And, you know, 40 years later, those words really hold a, a more of an important meaning. Uh, meaning. Uh, and so after it was the Motown Missile, of course, you know, when somebody else gets it, they're going to put their own colors, their own name on it. Uh, and this is just one of the other transitions that it went through. Eventually, this is where the car uh, would rest and uh, just a dilapidated state. Uh, when most people didn't know where it was, it was in this guy's yard in Canada where it sat under a tarp for uh, over 20 years. And uh, the few people that did know where the car was were very sad to, to see it in this state, and some even thought that it was beyond repair. Uh, so how does the car get all the way from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, to Star, Mississippi? Why well, you haul trailer, of course, uh, which is also <laughs> available through Paul's Body Shop. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, tr the car did make the trek all the way down there, and so the story of how it actually um, found Paul's Body Shop uh, the car, as I said, sat there with intentions of restoration, uh, but the owner just didn't have the means to make that happen. 
but he had a friend uh, that knew uh, our family from way back in the days of the Mustang Shelby shows, and uh, it just so happened uh, whenever uh, Katrina came to New Orleans in 2003, he had a car that he had intended to restore that was flooded in Katrina, and so he was forced to do a restoration on it immediately because if he had not, all of that salt water would have just rusted that car away into nothing. Thankfully, uh, my mom and dad had the same home phone number that they had had forever, and so he called them up, and that was how uh, we got the job to do the restoration on his car. And the gentleman, uh, his name is Eddie, and he is, uh, along with Mr. Mark Williamson, who had the car, they formed a partnership, and uh, it's the Motown Missile LLC, and so that's how the, the restoration came about, that's how it came to us. Um, so, just a little coincidence thing, if, uh, if you look, this is a picture taken back in the 70s, and right here in the picture is George Paul. Uh, how could he have known that 40 years later he would be restoring that same car? Um, that's just a neat little story there. So, before we even began the restoration, uh, one of the original team members, Dick Oldfield, was uh, flown down from Buffalo, New York to the body shop to look the car over and verify that this was in fact a Motown missile. Uh, and in this picture you can see he's actually looking uh, at the quarter panel and the reason why is when they took that car into their race shop, they made some modifications on the car and moved some things around and actually cheated to help uh, transfer weight more how they wanted to. So it wasn't exactly stock, it was more of a loose term uh, for that team. Something that they never got caught for and that's just something that, you know, in racing, you do. You're, you're, not, you're not cheating unless you get caught. That was true for them. Uh, okay. All right, so now I'm going to briefly show you some, a little bit, of uh, thing that we've been using throughout the restoration process, and it is time-lapse photography. And we've used it in different stages, uh, and it's just a neat way to just kind of show over a long period of time uh, some of the major work that's been done. Uh, we actually took two days of just tearing down the car to get it ready to send it off to uh, metal refinishers in Jackson where we would get an acid bath. And after we got through with the teardown, I've got on this video here, we painstakingly went through and cataloged well, I went to the next slide, but there's pictures of um, just all the parts, everything that we took off, we labeled everything to try to just um, catalog everything for whenever it goes back together. This is after it came back from metal refinishers in Jackson, and what it is, it just goes in a vat of acid and it strips away all the paint, all body filler. Um, there's even, you can see in a seam in the factory where they connect the roof to the quarter panel, uh, there's a metal they use to kind of fill that in there, and it took that metal away. Um, but something obviously we added back. Showing the cutout on the fender where they cheated. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can actually see, and I've got a picture later that shows it better, but you can see where they, um, and I'll show you where they did the cutting and, and modifying. Uh, in 2012, in the middle of the restoration, uh, there was a car show and a Hall of Fame induction for the driver of these three cars. Uh, he died in the early 70s. Um, but all the rest of the team members are still alive today, and this was the first time that all three cars were in the same place. Um, so it was a really special moment. It's going to be really awesome whenever the car that we have is completed. Um, so here it is. Uh, you can see much better. Uh, you know how they, it almost looks like Frankenstein, how they, they mess at the corner, but of course we're going to slick all that back out. This black coating that's on the car is something that we use in our restoration processes. Um, it's something that we, we didn't have whenever these cars were made originally, but the Nissan uh, plant uses this uh, whenever they build their new vehicles. And what it does, it uses an electrically, electrostatically charged method. One minute. Of, hmm? One minute. Sorry. Okay. Wow. Uh, so anyway, but what this does, it gets all this coating into all the frame rails and places that these cars did not have when they were first built. Um, so whenever we restore these cars and they go through this process, it's, it's better than original. Um, more of the time-lapse um, footage that we did there, reshaping the quarters. Um, a lot of the stuff that we did, we had to go off of photos because this was not just a, you couldn't go to 
1972 um, Plymouth Restoring Company in Order Parks. This was a race car, so we used photos uh, to rebuild uh, the suspension. A lot of it had to be built by hand. Um, this radiator, again with the pictures, we had to take three radiators to make one to, to match the one that was in the car. Uh, interesting story about the car, there were um, items, when they found out we were storing people would donate items back to the car that had over the years, and these were the wheels that originally came off of it. Uh, the grill was beyond re restoration, and they don't even make these grills anymore. So my dad found one in California, and the guy had it for sale for $900, and when he called him back, it was $1,500, because the guy realized what he had. They had to have the grill, couldn't get it anywhere else. And this is the nice little guarantee that came with the grill. If it breaks in half, you get the key. That's what we call the old stock. The guy had had it on the shelf in his garage for that many years. They so, did not remake that piece. Now mm -hmm. eBay's a 3000 So the car is getting really close to being finished in restoration. And this is a BNI exclusive here. We've just got the gold leaf. Uh, this is 23 karat gold leaf. Uh, it's Nobody does this. Uh, they have imitation gold leaf now, but back in the day when this car was made, the only way to, to put this on this car was real 22 karat gold leaf, and it's used by putting glue uh, on the car, and then you press the gold leaf on it, and then uh, the artist that we had do it, he goes and he puts the little turn in it, and then uh, there's red pinstriping that he all did by hand on there. Um, so if you want to follow more about the Motown Missile, you can go to paulcompanies.com.